Committee will come to order. I would like to begin this hearing by stating the Oversight Committee mission statement. We exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. And I want to welcome everybody here today. This is an exciting time, exciting time for me. I, uh, on a personal note, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to serve in the United States Congress and to serve as the, uh, the chairman of this, uh, of this subcommittee. It is uh, truly a thrill and an honor, and I hope to live up to the, the high expectations that I think people have in the, the roles and the duties in, in, this, uh, in, in, this, uh, in this seat. Um, this is the first meeting of the National Security, Homeland Defense and Foreign Operations Subcommittee. I would also like to welcome the Ranking Member Tierney. Uh, I look forward to working with him. I have a good personal relationship with him. And while we may disagree on some things, I think we can be united in, uh, in our love of country and, and the need and the function of this, of this, uh, of this committee. So I want to also welcome those uh, here that are here for the very first time and all the new members that have joined in this 112th Congress. Uh, looking forward to a, a very active year. Today we are examining the challenges facing the Defense Department and State Department as they transition from a military to civilian-led effort in Iraq. On November 17, 2008, the Bush administration and the government of Iraq signed a Status of Forces Agreement, which set a December 31, 2011 deadline for the departure of all U.S. military forces from Iraq. As agreed, the U.S. has withdrawn over 90,000 personnel, 40,000 vehicles and 1.5 million pieces of equipment. Today there are fewer than 50,000 U.S. forces in Iraq. As the military draws down, the State Department is ramping up. According to Ambassador Kennedy, the Department will, Department, quote, will continue to have a large civilian mission in Baghdad, end quote, to, quote, meet the President's goal for an Iraq that is sovereign, stable and self-reliant, end quote. In support of this effort, the State Department will help train the Iraqi police, operate an Office of Security Cooperation to manage foreign military sales, train and equip the Iraqi military, and ensure the, that, out, that ongoing reconstruction projects are properly transferred to Iraqi control. To do this, it will dispatch hundreds of employees to Iraq. Yet each of these employees will be supported by roughly 16 contractors. It is estimated that the State Department will eventually employ nearly 17,000 personnel as contractors. The rough cost of the U.S. taxpayer will be in, in the range of $6.27 billion in fiscal year 2012 alone. The State Department will rely on these contractors for services ranging from the simple food supply to counter mortar and rocket fire. Many in the oversight community have expressed concern about the State Department's ability to meet this daunting challenge, and rightly so. The State Department's core mission is diplomacy, not combat. In its July 2010 report, the Commission on Wartime Contracting stated that, quote, there is not enough evidence of a thorough, timely and disciplined planning approach to the coming transition." End quote. It is, in his written testimony today, the Commission still maintains that the State Department is not necessarily ready to carry out this mission. Stuart Bowen's written testimony today also questions the State Department's capacity, quote, to execute program elements in the post-DOD setting to ensure adequate oversight and, and simple, simply to function in the unpredictable security situation that will exist after troop withdrawal." End quote. These concerns are echoed by Ambassador Patrick Kennedy. In an April, 2007, April 7, 2010 letter to Under Secretary of Defense Ashton Carter, he stressed that the State Department would have to, quote, duplicate the capabilities of the U.S. military, end quote, in order to fulfill a security mission. In a plea to the Pentagon, Ambassador Kennedy warned the Department personnel would suffer, quote, increased casualties, end quote, without the transfer of military hardware, including Black Hawk helicopters and MRAP armor vehicles to state. As best we can tell, the Defense Department has yet to provide the necessary equipment or even necessarily formally respond to this letter. While cooperation between the top military officer and top diplomat on the ground in Iraq has been generally praised, it seems like the senior leadership of the relevant departments in Washington may be playing off on a different sheet of music. I am also concerned that State and Defense have a less than transparent with the Oversight Committee. It has come to my attention that personnel within each department have begun restricting the Oversight Committee's access to critical information and personnel. If this is the practice, it must end. 
This administration must be transparent and forthcoming with SIGR, GAO, the Inspectors General, that they may fulfill their obligations to oversee this transition. The central issue before us today is whether State Department is ready to assume the mission in Iraq. From all outward appearances, the answer appears to be no, at least a huge question mark. With only 10 months left, the administration must work quickly to get this right, if for no other reason than that over 4,400 American service members have given their lives for it. I look forward to hearing from our panel of witnesses today. I would now like to recognize the distinguished ranking member, the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Tierney, for his opening statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and congratulations on your, your new role. Uh, I think we will have an easy time uh, working together on this. The oversight is not a partisan matter. I think you can tell that from the work that we have done over the last four years and a number of projects that you and I have discussed and participated in. So this is uh, one of the functions of Congress. You are right. We legislate and then we try to make sure that, that legislative intent is carried out and the money is spent in the most efficient and effective way possible. Uh, with that in mind, I want to thank all of our witnesses here today, some of us becoming old friends, uh, it seems, as we work on this. Uh, this is a topic that has been much discussed, but I think it is well worth continuing uh, that examination, particularly in light of the 2011-2012 budget discussions that are going on right now. Uh, you know, we did agree to withdraw all of our troops from Iraq at the, by the end of 2011. Uh, been, we have been sticking to that agreement and we are on track to meet that deadline. Uh, there has been a heroic sacrifice over eight years that cost over 4,000 American lives and nearly a trillion dollars. And the men and women of our armed forces are going to leave Iraq with their heads held high. But now the task is to make sure that all that hard work that was done by the military uh, the gains are not squandered, and Iraq's fragile stability is not lost. So the President has charged the State Department with the responsibility for supporting the stability and development of Iraq once the military has left. And that transition of operations to the State Department marks a whole new role for the State. Uh, it has been asked to oversee functions traditionally under the purview of the Department of Defense. Of particular concern are the State Department's capabilities, uh, both operationally and financially, to undertake activities traditionally managed by the Defense Department and to oversee the expected increase in contractors operating in theater, all on a budget that is many orders of magnitude smaller than what the Department of Defense has been working with. Simply because the State Department is taking on these new functions, uh, we can't accept the contractors will entirely fill the void. One of the primary objectives in establishing the Wartime Contracting Commission uh, when Jim Leach and I put the legislation together and when Congress passed the bill, I believe, was to ensure that contractors were not performing functions that were properly reserved for government personnel. Uh, during previous oversight committee hearings uh, on this subject, I discussed at length with Mr. Thibault uh, the fundamental necessity of identifying inherently governmental functions leading up to this transition. Uh, in spite of those concerns, in many respects, we are no closer to identifying and staffing inherently governmental positions than we were when the hostilities in Iraq began eight years ago. And the transition in, transition in Iraq uh, is an effort led by the State Department threatens to make the situation even worse. So not only do we have inherently governmental functions that haven't been clearly defined, but according to reports, contracting has often become the default option uh, out of necessity for the State Department. It doesn't give me much comfort that the State is aware of the oversight and capacity problems uh, it, if it does not have the time and financial resources to properly address them. Uh, as Mr. Green and Mr. Thibault uh, state in their written testimony, and I quote, an expanded United States diplomatic presence in Iraq will require State to take on thousands of additional contractor employees that it has neither the funds to pay nor the resources to manage, end quote. So yesterday the Commission on Wartime Contracting issued a report entitled Iraq, a Forgotten Mission. And that was with a question mark at the end of it. The report states that without a substantial increase in budgetary support from Congress, the post-2011 prospects for Iraq and for the United States' interest in that region will be bleak. It continues, and I continue to quote, without increases to sustain operations for fiscal year 2011 and beyond, it is inevitable that some missions and capabilities will be degraded or sacrificed altogether and that large outlays of taxpayer funds will have been wasted, end quote. In fact, the Commission's number one recommendation is that Congress ensure adequate funding to sustain State Department operations in critical areas in Iraq. Unfortunately, today, Congress's willingness to ensure adequate funding for the State Department's mission in Iraq is very much in doubt. H.R. 1, the Republican-led appropriations bill that passed the House in February, dramatically cuts State Department funding overall and makes specific cuts to the major programs that are critical to the mission in Iraq. According to Secretary Clinton, who testified yesterday in front of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, I quote, 
the 16 percent cut for State and USAID that passed the House last month would be devastating to our national security and it would force us to scale back dramatically on critical missions in Iraq, Afghanistan and Pakistan." End quote. This is the definition of penny wise and pound foolish. After investing so much blood and nearly a trillion dollars in Iraq, we must give the State Department the basic resources they need in order to successfully relieve the military of their mission there and help ensure Iraq's stability and future prosperity. Indeed, the State Department effort in Iraq is vastly more affordable than the operation led by the Defense Department. As Ambassador Kennedy notes in his testimony, withdrawing the U.S. military from Iraq will save $51 billion in fiscal year 2012, while the State Department is only seeking a roughly $2.5 billion increase in its budget to take over many of the same responsibilities. So about for about 4 percent of the funds that were being spent with the Department of Defense, State believes it would be able to carry out its mission. It is important for this subcommittee to continue to scrutinize this transition, but we must also look at the context of proposed budget cuts that would fundamentally undermine the State Department's ability to successfully achieve its new responsibilities. Mr. Chairman, we certainly have to watch every penny and where it goes, and we have to make sure that money is wisely and efficiently spent. On the other hand, we shouldn't be guaranteeing success by so undermining uh, their responsibility that we won't give them at least enough resources to get the job done, to move as many people in the State itself to the inherently governmental functions and have at least enough people to manage and maintain the contracts that it does have to give out. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, welcome again to, to uh, the members uh, here from both sides of the aisle. Particularly, uh, uh, I want to recognize uh, Ranking Member Cummings uh, for being here with us today. We uh, members will have seven days to submit opening statements for the record, and we'd now like to recognize our panel with very brief uh, intros. A very distinguished and accomplished uh, group. I appreciate uh, you all being here with us today. The, the panel includes Mr. Grant Green, who is a commissioner on the Commission of Wartime Contracting. Mr. Michael Tebow co-chairs the Commission on Wartime Contracting. Mr. Stuart Bo Bowen, who is the Special Inspector General for Iraqi Reconstruction. Uh, Ambassador Patrick Kennedy, who is the Under Secretary of State for Management. Ambassador Al Alexander Vershbau is Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs and Mr. Frank Kendall, who is the Principal Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition Technology and Logistics. Pursuant to committee rules, all witnesses will be sworn in before they testify. Please rise and, please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give to this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. You may be seated. Let the record reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. In the affirmative. Now we are going to go to and move to, uh, to opening uh, uh, statements. I would appreciate if you could keep your verbal comments to five minutes. We have a, a large panel and members who would like to ask some, some questions. You should have a light there when it turns red. I would appreciate it if you could wrap up your comments. Just also, if you could also make sure we have this nice, new, beautiful room. Just make sure that the button is pushed as you start the microphone and, and move it uh, close so we can all hear you. Otherwise, we will start with Mr. Green. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Chairman Chaffetz and Ranking Member Tierney, members of the subcommittee. Uh, I am Grant Green, a member and former acting co-chair of the Independent and Bipartisan Commission on Wartime Contracting in Iraq and Afghanistan. Participating with me in this joint statement is Commission Co-Chairman Michael Tebow. Our biographies are on the Commission website, <coughs> so I will note just a few points that bear on today's issues. I am a retired U.S. Army officer, have served as Assistant Secretary of Defense, Under Secretary of State for Management, and Executive Secretary of the National Security Council. Mr. Tebow, who is also a U.S. Army veteran, served more than 35 years in the Department of Defense, the last 11 as Deputy Director of the Defense Contract Audit Agency. He has also worked in the private sector as a consultant and as an executive for a Fortune 500 company. We are here on behalf of all eight Commissioners who yesterday approved release of a fourth special report to the Congress, which we have titled Iraq, A Forgotten Mission. We have brought uh, printed copies with us today and have also posted the report on the Commission's website. As with our appearance today, the report reflects bipartisan consensus. We respectfully request that it be included in the Committee's hearing record. This hearing poses the question 
U.S. military leaving Iraq, is the State Department ready? I think the short answer is no, and the short reason for that answer is that establishing and sustaining an expanded U.S. diplomatic presence in Iraq will require State to take on thousands of additional contractor employees that it is neither funds to pay for nor the resources to manage. We base our findings and recommendations on the Commission's research hearings, uh, as well as two trips to theater to probe specifically the transition process. Mr. Thibault and I led the first trip, which prompted our July 12, 2010 uh, special report titled Better Planning for Defense to State Transition in Iraq is Needed to Avoid Mistakes and Waste. Commission Co-Chair Christopher Shays and I led the second trip to Iraq on this issue in December. We observed significant progress, but our observations and subsequent research have led to our follow-on special report, the one I brought with us today, Iraq, a Forgotten Mission. Teams of State and Department of Defense have been working hard on identifying transition needs and dealing with hundreds of tasks ranging from logistical support and medical care to air movement and security. States plan to establish two permanent and two temporary locations in parts of Iraq away from Baghdad will also require reconfiguring some property still occupied by the U.S. military and undertaking some new construction. All of these activities will require increased contracting as well as additional funding and increased staffing for contract management and oversight. This is a particularly problematic when you consider that the State Department's recent Quadrennial Diplomacy and Development Review acknowledges that, number one, contracts are often State's default option rather than an optimized choice. Contracts are often well into the performance phase before strategies and resource for managing them is identified. Third, its contract management and oversight capability has languished even as contracting has grown. And finally, State has a need to restore government capacity in mission-critical areas. State deserves credit for recognizing these problems, which we would note also occur in many other Federal departments and agencies. Besides the collaboration and contract management challenges, other looming problems for the DOD to State transition is time. As you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, 10 months from today, all but a handful of U.S. military personnel will be gone from Iraq. State needs to have many new contracts in place with contractors at work by October or even sooner to ensure a smooth transition. And that means many contracts must be launched quickly, in fact, should have already been launched. As concerned citizens, we can all agree that the stakes in Iraq and the region are high. We can all agree that members, as members of this Commission, however, that we are confining our observation to the implications of the contracting required for State's planned presence in Iraq after 2011. We are not opining on the merits of State's plan or urging that Congress provide everything that the State Department has requested. If anything, considering the extent of contracting waste, fraud, and abuse we have seen in Iraq and Afghanistan, we would encourage the Department and lawmakers to examine that plan closely to seek, where appropriate, more economies and safeguards for taxpayer dollars. We are simply pointing out here that the declared coordinated policy of our government to expand the Department of State's role in visibility in Iraq after the U.S. military departs, has large and unavoidable consequences for contingency contracting and must be recognized and resolved. Our new special report, Iraq, a Forgotten Mission, spells out our concerns in more detail. We will close by quoting the three recommendations in that report that the Commission recommends. Number one, that Congress ensure adequate funding to sustain State Department operations in critical areas of Iraq including its greatly increased need for operational contract support. Number two, the Department of State expand its organic capability 
to meet heightened needs for acquisition personnel, contract management, and contractor oversight. And three, the Secretaries of State and Defense extend and intensify their collaborative planning for the transition, including execution of an agreement to establish a single senior, senior level coordinator and decision maker to guide progress and promptly address major issues whose resolution may exceed the authorities of departmental working groups. Thank you. Mr. Green and, and others in the panel, feel free. You can submit the balance of any testimony into the record, but given that we have gone over seven minutes at, at this point, I would like to transition to the next speaker, okay. if I could. Fine. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. I believe we are going to go are we going to go to Mr. Bowen then? I believe we, it was a joint statement, so okay, appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chief. Very good. Uh, thank you, Chairman Chaffetz, uh, Mr. Tierney, members of the committee, for this opportunity to testify on the crucial question uh, before you today, before the country today, and, and that is, is the State Department prepared to sustain and engage in the significant programs necessary to support Iraq? over the next year and, frankly, over the next five years. This is, this is not a, a, a perennial issue. This is a significant national security issue. And so before I answer that question, let me provide three premises that put my answers in context. One, the United States will continue to support Iraq next year and for the next five years because we have crucial national security interests at play there. Two, the State Department will be in the lead there and will need to implement programs that it can execute to, so that those national security interests are protected. And three, to meet that mission next year, over the next five years, it will require substantial resources to do so, much less than the resources expended over the last eight years annually. Uh, as General Austin testified a few weeks ago before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, the DOD was spending $75 billion last year. Uh, on maintaining its mission in Iraq. The State Department, as Secretary Clinton testified yesterday, uh, will spend a fraction of that next year over the next five years. Is the State Department ready to, today to manage the DOD programs uh, that are at play in Iraq? No, self-evidently no, because there is a significant planning and execution uh, program underway regarding transition. Will they be ready on January 1st of 2012? Uh, th there, that time will tell. Do they have the capacity to execute the programs that they are shaping and scoping? Uh, yes, but there are concerns that we have raised over time about contract management. There is obviously no doubt about the, the truth that the contracts the State Department had to take on in Iraq over the last eight years were the largest in its history. And SIGR has issued an, a number of audits that raised, frankly, core concerns about its capacity, its acquisition management, its, its, its ability to keep track of money, you know, to, to break it right down to the core matter uh, in Iraq. Has it made improvements? Yes. Does it need to do more? Yes. Uh, Ambassador Kennedy in his statement acknowledges that and also points to important steps that the State Department intends to take, notably the evaluation of results about its programs that it, that it will implement. Uh, I think m one of the things that they most need to do, and I told Paco Palmieri this uh, two weeks ago when I was in Iraq, the, the head of INL, right, the INL program there, is to ensure they have sufficient number of in-country contracting officer representatives that are keeping track of taxpayer dollars. Uh, yes, we have to spend substantial resources. Yes, it is crucial to sustain the fledgling democracy in Iraq, but yes, we must steward that money, that money for those programs in an effective way to assure the taxpayers that their money is being well spent and it has the salutary effect of improving the execution and performance of those policy initiatives. I just returned from TRIP 29. I met with General Austin. I met with uh, uh, Ambassador Jeffrey. I met with the Iraqi leadership. And, and they are collectively concerned about what Iraq will be like after the troops withdraw. And those concerns stem from capacity to execute programs, but also security. Uh, one thing that is predictable about security in Iraq, it is unpredictable. And it is going to be very difficult uh, to, to judge today uh, what, it, what the environment will be like 
in 2012. And the, so the State Department is planning, worst case scenario, as it should, and it, so its, its capacity to operate will be limited by that security environment. SIGR is on the ground today carrying out audits of the transition program, specifically of Quick Response Fund, which we will soon release, of private security contractors, of rule of law, crucial element that, that must be improved. Corruption is as bad as it has ever been. That is what Judge Rahim, the Director of Corruption Fighting for the Iraqis, told me just two weeks ago. Uh, he, he cannot convict a senior official. They can still uh, immunize any employee by fiat. These are unacceptable standards within the system that, frankly, we are going to have to continue to engage heavily with Iraq. Uh, it, it, on all fronts, and, that, and, and we, I am talking about the State Department, to improve their fledgling democracy. Uh, we recommend two things in our statement that the, that the Committee might consider regarding the use of the substantial funds over the next year. And one is that for any of these large contracts, that, that the State might submit a plan for review uh, so that you see what the strategic intentions and tactical uses of the, those billions uh, will be. You have transparency, the transparency that you expressed a need for at the, in your statement, Mr. Chairman. And second, that they certify uh, to the Congress that they have the resources in place and that they are committed to the oversight, to the contracting officer representatives, so that you have the capacity to do your job, and that is manage uh, the taxpayers' dollars effectively. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ambassador Kennedy. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> Ranking Member Turney, uh, members of the committee, thank you for inviting me today to discuss the State Department's preparations for the United States' transition from a military to a civilian-led presence in Iraq. Our efforts in Iraq are critical in supporting an Iraq that is sovereign, stable and self-reliant, and to achieve a strategic long-term partnership between the United States and Iraq. The Administration's request will provide resources for the diplomatic platform that will provide U.S. interests in Iraq be advanced. As Secretary Clinton, Secretary Gates and Admiral Mullen have emphasized, shortchanging our civilian presence now would undercut our enduring national interests in Iraq. Between 2010 and 2012, the U.S. military drawdown will save the United States taxpayers $51 billion, while State's total operating budget request for Iraq will only increase by $2.5 billion. State's 2012 funding needs will increase because of the military to civilian transition, but the overall cost to the U.S. taxpayer will decrease dramatically. In short, a stable Iraq is in the U.S. national interest, and anything less than full funding would severely affect the transition. This is an overview of the larger Iraq policy issues. Today I would like to address the safe and secure management platforms needed to support successful implementation of our Iraq policy, which are my responsibilities. There are eight key components to launching those platforms. Security. In addition to our embassy in Baghdad, we are planning consulates general in Erbil and Basra and embassy branch offices in Mosul and Kirkuk. All U.S. personnel and contractors will be under chief of mission authority. Security will be shared with the State Department's Bureau of Diplomatic Security, responsible for all State Department sites, and DOD responsible for Office of Security Cooperation personnel. At locations where State and OSCI co-locate, diplomatic security and DOD security will coordinate movements, but diplomatic security will have sole responsibility for facilities. Contracts for static movement and security uh, 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 movement have already been awarded or are about to be. Thanks to our assistance and from our friends at DOD, we are finalizing an agreement with DOD to loan us 60 MRAF vehicles and we will use a U.S. Army existing contract for vehicle maintenance. An unmanned aerial vehicle reconnaissance program is being established. We are coordinating with DOD on a sense and warn system for indirect fire and we will have tactical radio communications in our vehicles and tactical operations centers at all our sites. Medical. We will establish robust medical units in Basra, Baghdad, Kirkuk and Mosul, and smaller medical units in seven other locations. These units will stabilize trauma cases that will then be moved to nearby First World medical facilities in Jordan and Kuwait, and we expect to award that contract by the 20th of May. Contracting and contract oversight. Our success in Iraq depends on effective contracting efforts. 
Unlike other U.S. embassies, Iraq is a non-permissive environment, which means we cannot hire local staff as static guards or as cleaning crew, nor can we visit markets, gas stations or pharmacies. We are heavily dependent on contractors until security improves and have developed a contracting strategy for life support, security, transportation, communications and facilities. While it is most effective for State to use its own uh, competitive process to award contracts, we also will leverage DOD resources where DOD has superior contracting capabilities in theater. One example, the Logistics Civil Augmentation Program, or LogCap, is a proven support mechanism with strong mandatory contract management requirements. Interim use of LogCap will give us time to put our own into place and we will also be using the Defense Logistics Agency for food and fuel. I take our contracting oversight responsibility seriously. I led the 2007 Nasir Square uh, review team in that regard, and I can assure you that we will engage heavily. Our contracting team in Washington draws on headquarters expertise, and while in Iraq there are multiple levels of technical oversight. Since uh, 2008, when I reorganized the funding stream for the Office of Logistics Acquisition Management, we have hired 102 additional staff for contract administration and in, for security contracting oversight in Iraq, we will have over 200 direct State Department security professionals engaged. That is a 1 to 35 ratio, which is very, very good. We are not using contractors by default. It is a deliberately chosen strategy to address a transitory need. It makes no sense to hire that many individuals to become permanent U.S. government employees when the needs for those numbers will decrease over time. Let me be clear, we will transition. In Erbil, in the North, already 92 percent of our Guard Force is locally engaged staff. And we have robust efforts underway in real property, aviation facilities, information technology and life support. Finally, on, on February 14, Secretary Clinton announced Patricia Haslack as the coordinator for Iraqi transition assistance. This is the largest effort underway in the State Department since the Marshall Plan in the 1940s. We will be ready. Thank you, Ambassador Kennedy. Ambassador Virchbau. Oh, Mr. The Chairman, Mr. Kendall will give the main statement for the Department of Defense. Thank you. Mr. Kendall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Chaffetz, Representative Tierney, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity for Ambassador Virchbau and I to appear before you today to discuss the challenges associated with the transition from the Department of Defense uh, to the Department of State in Iraq. I ask you to include my written statement in the record. The DOD is fully engaged in support of Operation New Dawn, ensuring a smooth transition of DOD functions to State in support of the enduring U.S. government diplomatic and security assistance missions, while providing oversight of logistical functions associated with the orderly withdrawal of the Title X military forces by the end of December 2011. We are already in the execution phase of this transition. DOD recognizes the importance of the transition in Iraq and that there are significant material and support issues. We are fully committed to executing our role within the boundaries set out in the security agreement between the U.S. Government and the Government of Iraq. We have undertaken a whole-of-government approach to support State as relations normalize in Iraq. While ultimately the role State will play in Iraq is not in itself unusual, the scale and complexity of the transition presents a huge undertaking, and DOD is doing everything it can to make this transition successful. While the Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition Technology and Logistics uh, is not responsible for establishing policy in this area, we are responsible for the success of the material, contract, supply and selected construction components of the transition. DOD and State have established a temporary senior executive steering committee, or group, for coordination and synchronization. The group is co-chaired at the Deputy Assistant Secretary level and meets biweekly to review status and progress of eight subordinate functional areas. Those areas are supply, uh, supply chain, equipment, contracting, medical facilities and construction, information technology, security and aviation. The twelfth meeting of the steering committee was held yesterday with direct participation from the Embassy and U.S. forces in Iraq, as well as other key players. To facilitate the whole of government coordination, in November 2010, DOD embedded a staff officer within the transition team and state to serve as a liaison and work day-to-day -day issues. Additionally, to expeditiously respond to requests for equipment, a joint combined uh, OSD and joint staff equipping board was established in early January of 2011. 
These activities have been overseen by Ambassador Kennedy and myself, with assistance from Under Secretary of Defense for Policy and the Joint Staff, among others. Currently in Iraq, Joint State and DOD teams have been established in each of the remaining locations to develop practical solutions to issues resulting from the downsizing of the site footprint. The transition of these sites is not a turnkey operation, and each presents unique challenges. For example, each site team is establishing new perimeters and moving T walls, relocating containerized housing units, rerouting utilities, and where needed undertaking general site preparation. These actions are occurring at varying degrees at all the enduring sites. To enable secure communications to these sites, DOD is restructuring its secure network infrastructure to accommodate the changing footprint. I visited Iraq in October and met with Ambassadors Jeffrey and Jackson, as well as General Austin, to discuss plans for transition. The chairs of the Senior Executive Steering Group recently returned from Iraq, where they conducted site visits to future State Department enduring presence posts to ensure that transition plans are proceeding. State does not have the management and oversight capacity in theater to immediately handle the large-scale support requirements for all the remaining sites. Therefore, the Department of Defense will provide a number of specific functions in accordance with the Economy Act. The Log Cap 4 contract will provide base life support and core logistics services. The request for proposals was released in January 2011. Proposals are due in five days, and we expect to make the award in July. Food distribution and fuel distribution and supply will continue to be provided by the Defense Logistics Agency, as Ambassador Kennedy mentioned. The Army Sustainment Command will provide maintenance contract support for those items not maintained under existing site contracts or log cap, such as the sense and warn systems and mine resistant ambush protection uh, vehicles that we are providing to the State Department. The Army Sustainment Command will also provide selected security contract support. DOD will provide fixed site contract security under combatant commander rules for the independent sites operating for the Office of Security Cooperation in Iraq. The synchronized uh, information systems, the synchronized pre-deployment and operational tracker, or SPOT, and the total operational picture support system have been designated by State as a personal management tool that they will use, and those, those will transition directly from DOD. State will reimburse DOD for all these contracts and services provided. DOD has received and continues to address straight requests for approximately 23,000 individual equipment items, ranging from medical equipment to counter-rocket protection. As mentioned above, a, equip a joint equipping board has been established to streamline and centralize the request process. There have already been a number of success stories with respect to the transfer of equipment. For example, we are loaning 60 Cayman Plus MRAPs in place of the basic model Caymans to provide a greater level of protection to State Department personnel. We took State's initial requirement for three CT scan systems for their medical equipment, which would have cost in excess of $9 million, and found a solution that would provide the scanners for less than $1 million total. We have found two excess CH-46 helicopters that were being provided to State with the potential of four more to be made available to meet an immediate need in State's worldwide air fleet and to free up other assets. The rules of engagement for fulfilling the equipment needs have been established. Excess items are being transferred at no cost. State is to provide funding for defense services associated with these transfers, including transportation and maintenance. Non-excess items are being provided on a reimbursable basis, though through sales from stock. In instances where funding is not available, those items will be addressed on a case-by-case -case basis by the equipping board cited above. DOD will consider loaning non-excess equipment on a case-by-case -case basis based on readiness impacts. All equipment transfers are being completed in accordance with the Economy Act. I just want to close by saying that we are very well aware of the challenges. Our greatest challenge is probably time. And Ambassador Kennedy and I are working together, as is our entire team, to ensure that we do the things that are needed to fully, uh, successfully execute this transition. Uh, another challenge, of course, is funding, and we are working also with the Iraqi government on some agreements which are not finalized. But we are beyond the planning phase, uh, though some planning continues. We are executing at this time, and we believe we are on track to meet the schedule that has been set up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you, Mr. Kendall. Thank you all. Uh, your entire statements can be submitted for the record. Uh, we are going to now move to the portion where members will be each uh, allowed five minutes for questioning, and we will alternate, uh, obviously, on different sides of the aisle. Um, I would ask the members to uh, try to maintain the five-minute uh, rule in, in deference to, to their colleagues in, in moving forward. Um, I would like to start, if I could, please. Uh, through uh, some discussions with the Special Inspector General, some written testimony from the Special Inspector, 
conversations that members have had in Iraq, uh, staff and whatnot, it is our understanding that both the State Department and the Department of Defense have actually been tightening up and, and, and uh, uh, not as been as forthcoming in providing the Special Inspector access to both the information and personnel that they have in the past. There are two memos in particular, one dated October 7, uh, 2010, another one uh, January 8, 2011, that have restricted this access. I guess I, I would appreciate a comment, perhaps starting with you, Ambassador Kennedy, about the State Department's uh, the, the, uh, uh, granting of access to documents and information. Is that something you are going to be forthcoming with, or is it something that we need to dive into a little deeper? Uh, Mr. Chairman, we deal with the Inspector General for Iraq. We provide him information. We provide information to the General Accountability Office. We provide information to the State Department's in, uh, Inspector General. We provide information to the Agency for International uh, Development's Inspector General. Each one of those individual entities has defined lanes in the road that have been worked out in response to congressional mandates, and we provide each one of those offices with all material that they, uh, that they are entitled to. Ambassador Verspow or Mr. Kendall, either one? Well, I guess what I am concerned about with the Department of Defense is this, uh, this new operating procedure that you have instituted that creates this delay of 15 days, having to fill this four or five page document out instead of this unfettered access that they have had previously. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I have to apologize, but I am unaware of any attempts to withhold any information, and I am not familiar with the memos. Um, our policy is to be, I believe, uh, the same as the State Department in these regards. I would be happy to take this for the record and get back to you on these specific uh, information. Perhaps, Mr. Bowen, you can express the concern. Uh, yes, and, and uh, on the DOD front, uh, I addressed this with General Austin. My staff has worked with his chief of staff over the last weeks, and we have resolved, I believe, satisfactorily the concerns that, that we have had regarding access, uh, um, at least it appears so, in practice. Uh, on, the, on the State Department front, yes, we get substantial information uh, from the Embassy, and I have to say Ambassador Jeffrey has been very forthcoming, as has, have been his, his uh, deputies. Uh, to put, just to, so, so it is clear, we are responsible for reporting on any contract, quote, to build or rebuild physical infrastructure in Iraq, to establish or reestablish a political or societal institution in Iraq, or to provide products or services to the people of Iraq. That is about as broad as it gets. That is the congressional mandate that you all have given us. Uh, it, we have had some problems over the last six months regarding getting information about the provincial reconstruction team transition, uh, transitions to the um, the uh, new embassy offices the, uh, support logistical contracts that, uh, that are going to um, help the State Department continue its mission in overseeing contracts that fall under these rubrics. My time is short as well. Um, my concern is that the access has not been growing, it has been shrinking. And the timing of that access is critical, not only for the Special Inspector, but for your own uh, Inspector Generals to do their jobs. We will continue to follow up, but this is of utmost imp importance, and I am trying to signal that here today. Any attempt to try to slow that process down or to hold back information I don't think will be met with, with uh, uh, it won't be met very well. Very quickly, uh, in July, for the State Department, if I could, Ambassador uh, Kennedy, in July of 2010, the State, uh, State Department identified 14 core lost functionalities, as they called them, everything from recovering killed and wounded personnel, recovering damaged vehicles, counter-battery -batter notification, counter-battery fire, things that traditionally Department of Defense has, has operated that now is going to the State Department. Um, the, the core question is, are you prepared to actually do this in the next 10 months? Um, how, in the world, how are you going to gear up to actually do that? Um, we are very concerned that these are some very difficult things to do. How prepared are you to do, actually fulfill those duties? Mr. Chairman, of the 14, that we are, I think we have resolved about seven of them. On the other hand, there are another seven that simply make no sense for the State Department or are simply not applicable. They disappear when DOD disappears. For example, the DOD has been assisting the Iraqi government in policing the green zone. That is not a function the State Department should take on in another nation. Uh, 
counter battery fire, the State Department engages in defensive activities of its personnel. We are never going to be launching 155 millimeter artillery rounds back at the, uh, at the opposition. That is a function of the government of Iraq. I'll be glad to submit something for the record, Mr. Chairman, but every, we will do everything that is necessary for us to do. However, there are simply functions that do dissolve and disappear when the Department of Defense leaves because they are military functions. Thank you, Ambassador. We will now recognize uh, the ranking member, Mr. Tierney, for five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, Ambassador Kennedy, I think uh, Mr. Bowen gave us a pretty good um, idea here uh, to help us with our work. So I want to put it to you for as close to a yes or no answer as you can reasonably do here. Uh, will you or the State Department submit to this subcommittee sufficiently in advance of implementation for our, our review and comment each plan uh, for carrying out your responsibilities, including the strategic and the tactical aspects? I think, sir, the, the answer is yes, but I mean, I do not have the, the kind of written plans, for example, I can provide a copy of our contract for the maintenance of the MRAPs. That is my plan. Right. I mean, I would like to meet But when you, you have a plan you know, for strategy and tactical carrying out any of the responsibilities that you have, if, uh, I take it as a yes that you will submit that for us sufficiently advanced for our review, and I appreciate well, that. We will certainly submit them for your, for the committee. However, everything yes. is ongoing. Every day we make decisions, right. Mr. Tierney. And but we you don't make a plan every day. Every day you carry out aspects of a plan. Exactly. Every so often you make a plan. When you, every so often you make that plan, the tactical and strategic aspects, I am taking it as a yes that you will submit it to this subcommittee in Congress so that we can have enough time to look at it. I think it was a good idea. It, it, it is an excellent right. idea, but we may have to implement it immediately. We will work with you. All right, on that. And will you certify to Congress uh, and the subcommittee that for each plan that you have the actual resources that you will need to implement it uh, and that you are committed to the management oversight of that plan? I can, we will certainly certify we are committed to the management oversight. However, we have plans that are dependent upon appropriations. Right. And so I cannot certify. You can certify the condition that, that you, uh, you have the resources subject to certain appropriations. I can certify that we have things subject to appropriations. And in that line, let me just go on for that. On February 17, uh, Secretary of Defense Robert Gates testified before the Senate Armed Services Committee and was pretty passionate about his call to support the State Department's budget request for fiscal year 2011 and 2012. Here is what he said. The budget request is a critically urgent concern because if the State Department does not get the money that they have requested for transition in Iraq, we are really going to be in the soup, close quote. Uh, further, he went on, he said, without this funding, quote, much of the investment that we have made in trying to get the Iraqis to the place they are is at risk, close quote. Admiral Mullen also added that sufficient investment in the State's capabilities was critical. Otherwise, we are going to be we are going back for a lot more investment and a lot more casualties. So despite these pleas from the defense and military leadership, last month the House passed an appropriations bill that seeks to dramatically cut State's budget request for fiscal year 2011. Secretary Clinton, as I said in my opening remarks, testified yesterday that the cuts would severely inhibit State's ability to perform its mission. Ambassador Kennedy, if H.R. 1 became law with that 16 percent cut in there, how would the cuts impact your ability to perform your mission in Iraq? Uh, Mr. Cherney, we would not be able to perform the mission that has been tasked to the State Department. Okay. Uh, and Ambassador Virchbaugh and Mr. Kendall, uh, am I correct in assuming that you agree with Secretary Gates? that full support for the State's budget request is essential to the success of the uh, our mission in Iraq? Absolutely, Congressman Turner. Uh, Mr. Thibault, the Commission's recent report on the Iraqi transition uh, makes its number one recommendation that Congress adequately fund the State to perform its duties in Iraq. Uh, in your view, what would happen to the mission uh, if Congress dramatically slashed State's top-line program budgets as proposed? Uh, Mr. Congressman, uh, the mission would not get accomplished. Uh, it would be mission failure. Uh, in the Commission on Wartime Contracting report that you released yesterday, uh, the recommendation was made that the State Department expand its organic capability to meet heightened needs for acquisition personnel, contract management and contract oversight. The report goes on to say that short of funding and program management staff to adequate, adequately conduct oversight of the thousands of contractors we will need to hire in order to successfully take the reins of the U.S. operations in Iraq from the Department of Defense. Some of these contracts will be for highly critical or sensitive missions, such as handling unexploded ordnance. 
In addition, the Commission warns that the scope of States' contracts in Iraq increases. Failure to provide for expanded oversight and implementation of contract administration strategies will lead to instances of waste, fraud and abuse in contracting. So, Mr. Thibault, do you think that spending money now to ensure the State can conduct effective oversight of the contracts, contractors necessary to implement the transition will ultimately prevent waste, fraud and abuse in contracting and save the American people money? Uh, yes, Mr. Congressman. And we also believe that uh, part of that process or plan includes uh, both the pre-award cost evaluation and analysis and the uh, previously mentioned oversight, <coughs> because they not only need the money, but they need the ability to uh, um, implement the program. Exactly so. Thank you. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. It is now my pleasure to recognize uh, the gentleman from Idaho, Mr. Labrador, who is going to serve as the Vice Chairman, a new member uh, of the 112th Congress and uh, somebody who just recently returned uh, to a visit to Iraq. Mr. Labrador, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Um, being new to Congress, I, I sometimes question some of the things that, that are happening here in Washington, D.C., and it seems like we make some, some assumptions. Uh, Mr. Ambassador Kennedy, um, Explain to, to the American people, really, there is going to be 17,000 new workers, uh, people employed in Iraq, yet 16,000 of them are contractors. Uh, that doesn't make any sense to me, especially when we pay contractors a lot more money than we pay government employees. Uh, can you explain how you justify that? On uh, two grounds, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. First of all, uh, the General Accounting Office did a study, which I would be glad yeah. to make sure that you receive, that actually shows that the State Department use of contractors in protective security operations actually saves the U.S. Government money in the long term. Secondly, we have a surge issue here in Iraq. We need aviation support. We need medical support. We need logistical support. <laughs> We need that effort in Iraq and in Afghanistan. I do not need that effort in a, the other 163 American embassies that we have. Hiring permanent United States government employees for a 20 or a 30 year career for a need in Iraq for aviation or particular security or explosive ordnance disposal, et cetera, et cetera, is not good government. It is not good for the American taxpayer to saddle them with the long-term 30-year bill for employees when I need them for a surge capability for a brief period of time. And therefore, when I, if I need them for a long period of time, they become government employees. If I don't need them for a long period of time, that surge capability is best done and least expensively done for the long haul with the use of contractors, sir. Okay, according to the GAO, for the far past three years, the State, DOD and USAID have been unable to determine the exact number of contractors you employ in Iraq. Um, without having reliable date, data on the number of contractor personnel it is currently relying on Iraq, how has State developed projections? regarding the number of additional contractor personnel after the drawdown of U.S. forces? Uh, two points, uh, Mr. Vice Chairman. One, I believe that I know exactly how many um, uh, contract employees I have on any given day in Iraq, and I would be glad to, to, uh, to meet with you or your staff to discuss that. But secondly, what we do is we have analyzed each of those major functions that I have referred to, aviation, medical, et cetera, and we have done a table of organization. I need so many pilots. I need so many bomb disposal personnel. I need so many static guards. We have a table of organization, and that is actually what we give to the contractor. You must fill each one of those billets. And then when they provide us personnel, we use a database that we have borrowed to, within the Department of Defense that is called SPOT, S-P-O-T, and we register every single one of those contractors in that database. So you, you claim the GAO is wrong. You do have a number. What is that number of contractors that we have? Uh, today, let me get, submit that for the record, because that number does change every day. So, but GAO was wrong when they said that you, you, didn't, you couldn't account for them. That is correct. I, be, I believe that I can account for every single contractor I have in Iraq, yes, But sir. you don't know right now what, they, what that number I, is. I did not bring. I brought our planning numbers for, uh, for the transition, I didn't bring with me my charts which show exactly how many I have on board today. My apologies. Okay. 
Now, Mr. Green, in his testimony under Secretary Kennedy disputes uh, your Commission's finding that the State Department did not arrive at its decision to use contractors by default. He points to the fact that the State has hired an additional 102 staff for contract administration, 200 managers for oversight of private security contractors, and is supplementing its oversight of the log cap um, contract with subject matter experts from DOD. Is this sufficient in your view? Uh, well, it may be sufficient today, but if you look at, and I don't disagree with uh, uh, Secretary Kennedy, uh, if you look at the number of contractors that the State Department will require uh, post-2011, post uh, they do not have enough oversight today to to oversee and manage those contractors in the way they should be. One of the things that this Commission has found in the last two years is a huge difference in the number of contracting, procurement, acquisition personnel on board, not just in State, but in every agency we have looked at, and the number of contracts that are being awarded. And so we have this lack of oversight generally. And with State, with the huge increase in the number of contractors that they are going to experience, uh, they need a lot more oversight, and they need it on the ground. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. you. The gentleman's time has expired. We will now recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Cummings from Maryland, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, as I have listened to this uh, testimony. And I want to thank you, gentlemen, for your testimony. It is very enlightening. We, um, I can conclude that we all understand that we need to tighten our belts, no doubt about it. But we have already spent eight years, $1 trillion, and lost, unfortunately and tragically, 4,000 American lives in trying to help Iraq. And certainly we applaud our military for all that they are doing. To slash the State Department's budget in this way at this time is not only irresponsible, but it is a clear and present danger to our national security. And as I listen to you, uh, Mr. Uh, Ambassador Kennedy, um, you were asked some questions about uh, if you did, if you had to take the cuts that are now seems to be coming down the, the pike, uh, we'd be in deep trouble, wouldn't we? Um, uh, sir, we would not be able to execute the mission that we have been given without the funding that is both in the FY11 President's budget and in the FY12. But yes, sir. And another term for that would be mission failure. Is that not correct? Yes, sir. Now. On February 24th, the Commission on Wartime Contracting released a re report entitled At What Risk? Correcting Our Reliance, Over Reliance on Contractors in the Contingency Operations. In the report, the Commission identified several policies and practices that hamper competition for contingency contracts. Ambassador Kennedy, you testified that State is considering bids for several functionalities that are vital to a successful transition in Iraq, including the police development program, security operations, and life support services. As State begins to the process of significantly expanding its uh, contracting and oversight functions in Iraq, what steps is the agency or what steps are you taking to expand competition? Uh, sir, we, we believe in competition. For example, on our security uh, for both static and movement security, we are engaged in competitive bids for all those contracts. For the construction of our facilities in Iraq, we are, our Office of Overseas Buildings Operations is using con competitive competition. For our medical contract, competitive competition. Our aviation contract was awarded by competitive competition. We are using competitive competition ourselves or we are riding DOD contracts that were awarded already by competitive competition, and we access them through the economy, Exer. We are using competitive competition. And do we have uh, a we do we have appropriate oversight over those contracts? Because we had some testimony 
a few days ago from GAO that we have contractors overseeing contractors. Uh, sir, we do, we do not have contractors overseeing contractors. Good. We, we are doing three things. We have increased significantly the staff of our contracting operation at headquarters. We are deploying and will deploy 200 U.S. Government diplomatic security personnel to oversee the contracting operations. We will have State Department medical personnel overseeing the medical contract, and we will have State Department logistics people, et cetera, et cetera, overseeing those contracts. We are deploying additional contracting officers, representatives, i.e., U.S. government employees, to oversee every single one of our. You understand why I am saying that? Because we want the American taxpayers' dollars to be spent effectively and efficiently. And I think it is very difficult when, that, when you have a contractor overseeing a contractor and we lose control over uh, the billions of dollars that we are spending. Let me just get to this last question. The Commission on Wartime Contracting and, and SIGGER testified that State does not have adequate resources in place for contract management and oversight. In its July 2010 report, CWC found that planning for moving vital functions in Iraq was not adequate for effective coordination of billions of dollars in new contracting and risk both financial waste and undermining U.S. policy objectives. Today, Inspector General Bowen testified uh, that he continues to have some concern about whether the State's current structure and resources provide a sufficient basis for managing very large continuing contractors, contracts and programs. Ambassador Kennedy, do you believe the State has the current structure? and resources necessary to manage and oversee the very large contracts and programs that State will be responsible for? And I assume your answer is yes, based upon what you just said. It, it, it is, sir. We have the plans. We have the program in place. The, my only codicil to that is that this carrying out the full program in Iraq depends on the President's budget requests for the State Department for FY11 and FY12 being enacted. I see my time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The Chair will now recognize Mr. Farenthal of Texas for five minutes, a new member of this committee. We welcome, and you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. And I, as a new member of this committee and, and not an expert in foreign affairs or the situation and never having been to Iraq, I am troubled by what I am hearing here. My impression of Iraq comes from what I see on television reading the newspapers, which might in and of itself be a mistake. But we are talking about a, an unprecedented logistical situation for the State Department going in there. We are talking about unmanned air vehicles. We are talking about recovering bodies. We are talking about trauma medical facilities. Uh, we are talking about pretty hefty defenses against uh, attacks. We are talking about not being able to get gasoline or groceries within the country. And I, this kind of troubles me. I realize the Bush administration set a hard deadline at uh, the end of this year for getting out of Iraq on a military basis. And I guess I will address this to the DOD. Mr. Kennedy or Ambassador Kennedy, you are welcome to jump in on this. It doesn't sound like we are ready for the military to get out of there if the situation requires this level of logistical support. Has anybody in the Obama administration or the DOD talked to the Iraqi government and said, hey, you think maybe it might be a good idea for us to stay a little bit longer until this is more stable? Uh, Congressman, that is a, a very good question. Uh, first of all, the decision to uh, draw down our forces by the end of this year was a mu mutual decision with the uh, government of Iraq. And uh, you know, we honor the commitments that we have made in the security agreement to, uh, to carry out the drawdown in a responsible way. Uh, we, we do think that the Iraqi security forces have become increasingly capable of managing uh, security uh, for the country as we go forward. Uh, they uh, have taken responsibility step by step. Uh, we transitioned to full Iraqi lead responsibility on September the 1st of, of, of last year, and uh, the security conditions, in our view, are improving. Uh, that is not to say that uh, everything is, uh, is, is perfect in Iraq, and there have been very dramatic and tragic uh, spikes of violence uh, in recent uh, weeks. Uh, but I think that uh, we have seen the Iraqis respond in a professional way. So we will depend more and more on the Iraqis for our security. But I think that uh, with the uh, effort that has been described here by Undersecretary Kennedy and by uh, Mr. Kendall, 
we are aiming to equip uh, our State Department colleagues for success. It is indeed going to be an unprecedented effort in its scale. Uh, that is all the more reason why Secretary Gates emphasized the need for uh, providing the State Department with the resources that it needs to, to succeed. And I, I would also emphasize the strategic importance uh, of Iraq in light of the recent dramatic upheavals uh, in the region. Uh, with all the popular pressures around the Middle East and North Africa for reform and democratization, Iraq is now serving as an example. I am excited that we have achieved the success that I think the Bush administration is Iraq being a shining example. But if they can't provide even groceries for us, I am not sure we are there yet. And maybe I will address Mr. Bowen. You spent any requests from anybody within the Iraqi government that maybe our military presence, uh, that we reevaluate our timelines? Yes, I am. I was in Iraq two weeks ago, and I met with a number of senior officials, specifically a deputy prime minister, who indicated that there is openness, at the very least, to renegotiating the security agreement. And I think Secretary Gates has speak, spoken openly about that possibility as well. Uh, but, but as Ambassador Vershbaugh noted, uh, th this is really uh, something that the Iraqis uh, secured from us originally in the security agreement, uh, and that, that they would really need to publicly uh, reopen. Uh, that uh, matter, of course, is, doesn't have much time. Uh, December 31st will be here soon. Are you aware of anybody within the administration that is actually uh, pursuing these discussions, or is this something they just kind of came up over coffee somewhere, or I guess tea? Uh, I, I, am, I am not uh, involved in the policy matters related to this issue. Uh, uh, I am just about out of time, so I will yield back my remaining 20 seconds. <laughs> Thank you. The gentleman yields back. We will now recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Quigley, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome to your new position. Um, I, I guess I am struck with something I heard someone from State say when I was visiting Iraq. Uh, we were being briefed and um, they kept saying, we want to make sure we have this right so we don't have to come back. Finally, after about an hour of that, uh, a few of the members said, we are not coming back. But there was a sense within the, the people there at State and some of what I hear here that we have to make things perfect. Um, I mean, let's name a Middle East country that isn't at least facing some possibility of extraordinary instability. I mean, are, are we going to embed ourselves to that degree, the degree you are talking about in Iraq to maintain the stability with love for our own national security? I, I just think perhaps we are talking about a bridge too far. And it is, uh, someone mentioned the corruption is as bad as it has ever been. I don't know that the people of Iraq will ever get along to the extent that you are talking about or that corruption is going to change, or that all the efforts that we have already done, or that you have planned for the next infinite number of years, will achieve what you would like it to do. It is, it is almost, from, our, from my point of view, impossible. So it is what stuck on my mind since I went there, and, and nothing has changed that I heard today. But let, let me ask Ambassador Kennedy a question on a specific issue. Um, you wrote a letter, I believe, April 7, 2010, to DOD, uh, the, the problems that the State Department will face in implementing the new life support system. Any number of other agencies, entities have expressed concerns as well. There are related issues. Could, could you elaborate and make us feel a little better about how that situation is going to play out? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, we have been receiving absolutely stellar cooperation both in Iraq and at, in the United States from the Department of Defense. They are providing us surplus equipment. They are providing us equipment on loan. They are permitting us under the Economy Act to ride, utilize their contracts, for example, for food, for fuel, for logistical activities. So we have now crossed that barrier. We now have a way forward in those activities thanks to the cooperation from the Department of Defense. The contract is, is on the street for that, uh, using the 
superior buying power, so to speak, of the Department of Defense. As you know, the Department of Defense has, has facilities all over the Middle East and, and, uh, and Southwest Asia, and therefore our ability to partner with DOD on these gives us greater economies of scale to save money for the American taxpayer and also permits us to use the, uh, the contracting capabilities and the contract oversight for DOD. So I am very, very pleased with the progress we have made, and we are on track, sir. What still needs to be done? Uh, well, the, the, contract, the contract has to be, has to be executed. It is now out for bid. We will get the bids back in. They will be evaluated by DOD, and it will be awarded. But there is plenty of time to meet the half October 1, half uh, December 31 deadline, sir. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Now we will recognize Mr. Yarmuth of Kentucky for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for your testimony, all of you. Well, Mr. Tierney inquired earlier about the, um, the impact of the top line cuts proposed in H.R. 1 and uh, on the ability to carry out your mission. You may not have viewed, uh, reviewed all of the the uh, provisions of H.R. 1, but uh, are there perhaps other provisions in H.R. 1 that concern you about uh, your ability to either in defense or state and carrying out the mission, things that may not relate to just the, the top line cut in the State's budget? Uh, my review, uh, sir, is that the, the major issue at hand here is the funding levels. I mean, the State Department has both a core mission in 165 countries in the world to advance our economic security, to provide life and safety for the thousands and millions of American citizens who travel to be the first, to be the first agency in, in terms of our border security, in terms of passport issuance, in terms of visa issuance overseas. Cuts of that magnitude are devastating not only to the State Department's Mission, special missions in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan, but they are also devastating to our core mission to advance uh, our national security through diplomatic means. Right. But were there any other cuts that, that uh, in any other budget besides State Defense? Were you concerned about any of the provisions in uh, H.R. 1 that related to the, these areas of operations? As far as I know, it is the State Department's cuts that are of gravest concern. We have requests before the Congress for both 11 and 12 which I think are still under consideration. But I think any substantial cut, as Secretary Gates mentioned, I think when he testified just a couple of weeks ago, uh, this is a dominant concern for us right okay. now, State Department's funding. Great. Uh, thank you for those answers. Uh, during the Oversight Committee's last hearing on this subject, um, there was some concern expressed about whether um, contractors were being asked to perform inherently governmental functions. And, Ambassador Kennedy, you mentioned before some of the functions that would disappear when, when um, the military operations ceased. But, Mr. Thibault and, and Mr. Green, do you believe that tasks such as IED clearance and hostage rescue are inherently governmental functions? Uh, Mr. Congressman, yes, yes, yes I do, uh, in the sense that absent, uh, there is there's two parts that have been discussed today. Uh, are, are the Iraqis ready? to assume responsibilities, and then secondly, uh, absent a military solution, are contractors the, the right solution? Uh, I have seen no indication that on the highly technical areas we are discussing here, such as IED removal, such as counter battery, and when I say highly technical, I mean competence also, uh, UAV, that that that's something that we would transfer to the Iraqis. So it leaves it to the military is doing an exceptional job. And I, and I might use counter-battery, uh, and, and, I, and I try to visualize things. But the, what I have seen is if uh, uh, the enemy, you, and I think everyone has seen it, will bring a small pickup truck, throw down one rocket, pop the rocket, and leave. That is because the objective, DOD, is so exceptional at putting counter-battery on them within eight seconds. They know that. Uh, if that degraded, and we are talking about safety to all government and contractor personnel that are, are within an area of, of risk. If that degraded, the real question then becomes, would that knowledge be available? And then at that point, would there be the normal process of a military where you have a Ford observer, you redirect fire, and you really can do damage to target areas? 
Those are areas where, from an inherently governmental viewpoint, the United States Army is exceptional. And there are several areas such as that that, uh, uh, quite, quite frankly, I, I, I'm very uncomfortable personally, and we've discussed as a commission transferring those kinds of functions to the contractor world. Uh, thank you much. Mr. Green, did you want to add anything to that? No, I, I would certainly agree. Uh, some of these, uh, as we call them, functional areas that will be taken over by State uh, are very close, if not inherently governmental. I guess the basic question is, today, in the next 10 months, what is the option? Um, State is not going to hire and bring in-house uh, EOD personnel, and DOD is going away. So it leaves us very little wiggle room when it comes to performing many of these functions. Uh, hopefully, uh, you know, State uses uh, contractors now in other locations for I will call it bomb disposal, if you will. Uh, do they need to build that capability within their organization, and how often would you use it? So I, I think as ill-defined as uh, inherently governmental is today, uh, I think when you talk about the time, there are many of these functions, there are certainly a good number of them, that are appropriately done by contractors. And, and I might add, though, in, in building upon Commissioner Green, if I might, in about 10 seconds, the key for a State, if they go contractor, is to have and bring in government employees, because State has said it is not their objective to have contractors looking at contractors that are experts in the proper way to do these types of examples we have seen. I, I, I don't believe that a capability exists presently. Uh, I, I think that is something they would have to grow into in order to do the oversight. Thank you. Thank you for your response. Thank you. The, the Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. We are actually going to go to a second round of questioning, and a number of members uh, here would like to ask some questions. I am going to recognize myself for five minutes. Um, Ambassador Kennedy, I was struck here, actually, as we thought more about your answer to the 14 lost functionalities, um, that there were seven, and I would be interested to follow up on which seven stay and which seven don't. But I was really struck by your comment, of, and I hope I heard you right. We will have to go back and look at the record. You said that the State wasn't going to fire back. We may be actually taking mortar rounds. We may be taking rocket fire, but that you don't plan to fire back. Is that right? Yes, Mr. Chairman. We now, have, wait. Isn't that, we, I mean, we have no intention of using 155-millimeter uh, howitzers from the American Embassy compound to fire back into Iraq at So Iraqi. we are just going to keep taking the shells and, and just keep taking it? or No, no sir. We, we are already working very, very well with the government of Iraq, providing them with the locations that the uh, material has been fired at us and the Iraqi government has been successful, not to the degree that I wish they were, in disrupting those who would fire on our, on our diplomatic and consular positions. But it is, not, it is not the function of a diplomatic entity to engage in a defensive Well, and that is the concern. Like that. I mean, at the end of the day, that is the concern, that on January 1st we don't expect that suddenly it is going to be a, you know, a safe, safe place. And we will have to continue to explore this. Could, I, could I finish this? Yes. yes. The, there, there are two parts to the counter battery, sir, there is the, the, the return fire. But the prelude to that is called Sense and Warn, which we are retaining, which is a radar system that tracks the incoming yeah, fire I, I and familiar. sounds a warning for our people to take cover, and that we are retaining. This will obviously need to be more fur further uh, explored. Um, in a Senate Foreign Relations report issued by Senator Kerry on January 31st of this year, he maintains that as of December, land use agreements had not been signed and construction had not begun on satellite sites uh, with less than 10 months to go before the deadline. Could you please give us an update on this? Because it seems like a very short amount of time in order to build a fairly significant facility. You haven't even acquired the land. Is that correct? Uh, we are, we are very, very close to signing agreements with the, uh, with the government. What is that going to do to the timeline? Uh, we believe at the moment we are, we are still within the timeline because what we have done is part of our planning process in coordination with our Defense Department colleagues. We have identified the plots of land that we need. 
We have surveyed them. We have engaged the architectural and engineering work. And the contracts for the construction <coughs> have been sent out for bids, and the bids are back in. So the okay. delay in you are telling me you are going to still hit the, de the timelines. I, I, yes, at Mr. the Kendall. moment, I, today I am telling you I am still okay. going to hit Mr. those Mr. Kendall, timelines. briefly. briefly. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just want to mention so the committee understands that the land we will be using is land we are currently generally in possession of. So we are shrinking our bases essentially to provide compounds, if you will. Thank you. That, that is helpful. I, I do appreciate it. I need to move on. Uh, in April of 2010, uh, Ambassador Kennedy, you sent a, a fairly um, a direct uh, a statement out, a letter, uh, saying that without the equipment that you needed, for instance, Black Hawk helicopters and whatnot, that there would be, quote, unquote, increased casualties. I get a sense that some of that list has been, has, has, uh, has been to your satisfaction. But where are we on the list that you issued on April of 2010? Thanks to the good work of the Department of Defense, I believe that we are on track to receive everything that from DOD that I need or because of, for example, DOD's own shortage of Black Hawk helicopters, we are either acquiring other helicopters from Sikorsky. Okay, but you're, you're confident that you're going to get 100 percent of that, of that I'm, list? I'm, I'm confident that we will have 100 percent of what we need from multiple sources, including directly from the Department of Defense. Yes, sir. And then for the Department of Defense, the question is, how many troops, how many American military will be in country on January 1st or January 2nd? Those numbers are still a little bit in flux, but the entire OSCI, Office of Security Cooperation in Iraq, DOD presence will be under 4,000. Uh, the most recent number was about 3,900. We think we are going to come down 10 or 15 percent from that. And that is as of January that, 2nd? No, that is at the end of, yeah, yes, at, at January 2nd, 2011. Okay. Next year. It's next year. I am sorry, yes. 12. Next yes, year. 12, next year. Yes. Excuse me. Um, but we will still have close to, I am sorry, 4,000 troops? 4,000 we'll total U DOD personnel, of which roughly 1,000 will be government personnel. A subset of those will be military. The rest will be contractors. And, and what will the military personnel be doing there? Uh, various types of security assistance, training, missions such as that. And I appreciate some further clarification of that as, as we move forward. My time has expired, so I will now recognize for five minutes uh, the Ranking Member, Mr. Tierney. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador, you started to get engaged in the issue on uh, inherently governmental functions there beforehand. Is there something that you want to add to that conversation? I think it is an important topic. Uh, yes, thank you very much, sir. The State Department believes that the functions that we are being contracted out for are not inherently governmental. We would never violate the law and contract out for something that, that they are, these are complex functions, however. And so our predicate for handling these is to ensure, and I will use security as the example here, is to have very, very robust oversight by 200 diplomatic security, State Department career government professionals over that contract body. It is about a 1 to 35 ratio, which we believe will fully ensure that the contractors perform the non-inherently governmental functions under robust uh, dip diplomatic security supervision. Describe for me, if you would, a security mission that isn't inherently governmental. For example, if, if, if you look at many, many Federal installations or even State and local government installations in the United States, static guards, fixed guards around, around many Federal buildings in Washington are carried out by contract uh, security personnel. That, that it is widely accepted in the United States government that, that, that static security personnel are not inherently governmental because they do not have arrest authority and they do not um, engage in, uh, in law enforcement activities, sir. Don't you draw a distinction between the properties that we might be trying to protect and the people we might be trying to protect in a, a contingency uh, zone like Iraq and make a distinction there between a building in downtown Washington? Uh, no, sir, because, because I, think, I think the predicate of it is the same. But secondly, it, I have 1,800 diplomatic security personnel sworn worldwide. It makes no sense for me at all to move that number from 1,800 to 1,800 plus 7,000 for a period of time. The surge capability is, in my mind, what uh, contracting is for, is to, is to 
be able to grow the work when you have a particular need and then to shrink that work back for the benefit of the mission and the American taxpayer at the same time. How many Marines are going to be uh, protecting our embassy in Iraq? Uh, there will be probably, I would say, a couple of dozen. For the entire compound? Yes, sir. And we, will they be supervising any uh, contract security people? No, sir. The, the Marines are, do not supervise the contractors. The regional security officer supervises both the Marines and the contract personnel. Would you say that a, a hostage rescue mission is an inherently governmental function? I think that a hostage rescue mission in a war zone like, like Iraq, led by diplomatic security personnel and supported by contractors, stays within the boundaries of, of what is legal and what is not legal, sir. Why would you have that supported by contract personnel and not be strictly U.S. personnel? Because I do not have enough diplomatic security personnel to do the mission, and I do not have a permanent need for that many uh, personnel for, to hire individuals for a 20- or 30-year career. All right. So the first part I don't accept, all right, the idea on, on that is because it, um, I mean, you don't have enough people means it doesn't mean it is not in inherently governmental. It means no. basically you want to get to that point sometime and you are going to bring those people on. You just can't do it right now. Uh, I think we can have a debate yes. about uh, the surge capacity on that, whether yes. or not it makes sense for us to have enough capacity wor worldwide uh, that we can bring people and have people in areas where that is a likely situation and, and work on that. And I would like you to take another look at that, if you would. All right, well, I, and, and, I, and, and when you say a hostage situation, I mean, obviously, if I had the exact definition of what the individual situation was, I might very, very well use just diplomatic security uh, sworn personnel, special agents that I have on the ground. I might use those, those exclusively, given the situation. They might need support, however, from the uh, contractor personnel they supervise. I would like to think that we would have some capacity worldwide, as I say, that wouldn't make that kicking that type of a, a sensitive operation out to uh, contractors on that. And I hope we take another look at that maybe at some point. Inspector Bowen, just quickly, in your experience, uh, what is a rough ratio of management and oversight personnel to contractors and contracting dollars? What would be the appropriate uh, ratio? Within the State Department yes. spending? Uh, it, it varies on, on location. I mean, the, the number of contractors to, to uh, government personnel can, can range up to 60 to 1, down to, to 20 to 1, 15 to 1. Uh, but I think that the, the uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee report of January 31st makes an important point that, that the committee ought to uh, take under consideration advisement, and that is allow the regional security officer flexibility on how he or she spends that money across the country. For example, in Erbil, one bomb in eight years. It is a safe place. No Americans killed up in Kurdistan. But there are very high ratios and, uh, and, and standards of security protection that seem inconsistent with the real security situation. Allowing more fle creative flexibility, I think is the phrase that the report uses, will save taxpayer dollars. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. We will now recognize Mr. Turner of Ohio for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I want to thank you for holding this hearing and certainly the importance of, of this issue. And, uh, gentlemen, I, I'm going to apologize for the extent that my question may overlap with other questions. I'm on the Armed Services Committee and just came from a, uh, the Army Budget Hearing, where General Casey and Secretary McHugh are testifying. And I stepped away from that hearing to come and, uh, and, and ask my question today, because I think it, um, certainly what we've seen in the materials that are available from this hearing um, a great deal of concern as to how this, uh, this transition would occur. And, and I am going to, um, to follow on the questions about the contractors. Uh, in looking at the materials, I think it is pretty uh, startling to everyone that, um, that uh, upwards of 17,000 contractors um, may be relied upon. Uh, if you look at your plans, we are all concerned that you are going to rely heavily on contractors for security. And given the problems that the Department of Defense had in providing oversight of contractor operations, uh, I would like um, to express certainly my concerns and get your thoughts on the State Department's reliance on contractors and particularly the ability that it might, the impact it might have on our relationship with Iraq and with the Iraqi people. Uh, I have been to Iraq five times and Afghanistan five times, and I, I certainly we are all aware of the issues that we have had when we have looked to contracted um, security. 
General Caldwell was just before the NATO Parliamentary Assembly, and he voiced his concerns in the contracting process where he was looking at um, services for training Afghanistan um, military police and, um, and its military, saying that frequently the contracting promise process limited the scope and the ability to manage uh, what functions were occurring. Um, we certainly had also concerns of um, how uh, contractors relate to uh, the Iraqi people or um, the government itself. Questions have, have arisen concerning status of forces of agreement. What is the status of contractors? I would like you to, um, to address also that issue as to while, while they are in Iraq, uh, what, uh, how they will be treated, the contractors themselves, what is their legal status. And uh, then also the issue of the oversight of dollars, because there is obviously a significant amount of, of dollars that will be, um, uh, will be applied toward these, uh, the contracts themselves. Could you speak about that for a moment, please? Uh, yes, sir. If I could divide it into three pieces, I think, and be responsive to you. The first is, uh, I think when you talk about contractors and the security arenas, in gross terms, you talk about either fixed uh, static security on the one hand and movement security on the other. The, uh, the fixed and static people stay within the walls or in the perimeter of the United States Embassy in Baghdad or our, or our post outside. And so their interaction with the, uh, with the uh, Iraqi people is very, very limited because their, their mission is within, within the walls. On movement security, where we are escorting members of Congress, other distinguished visitors, or our own personnel out into the city, every one of those movements, which is staffed by contractors, the agent in charge of that movement is a State Department U.S. government security professional who gives directions to the contractors and is in control of that operation at all times. So we think we have, we have oversight, and that is my second point. We have oversight both in the sense of the contract, we have oversight in, in, in terms of the control of the contractors' activities when they are engaged in their, uh, in their missions. The third point, sir, you ask about the status. The, uh, the contractors are, n are not covered by any type of uh, diplomatic or consular immunity under either of the two Vienna Conventions. If they engage in any, any inappropriate conduct, they are subject to both potentially U.S. law, but also they would be uh, subject to Iraqi law. Well, that, that takes me to, to my, my point, is, and I appreciate your use of the word inappropriate, but it also places them at risk for appropriate actions, does it not, as they go set about providing uh, security, if there should be a security issue that is addressed. Um, you have uh, you know, significant issues that need to be addressed with, the, with respect to what their relationship is to what has occurred. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think we have certainly seen there are probably uh, dozens of news stories that we have all read of issues where there has been a security interest, a security issue that has arisen, and um, a concern with the uh, security forces having been contract forces. Uh, do you have thoughts as to how you will be addressing that? Uh, yes, sir. There is a joint U.S.-Iraq security group that is that led by the regional security officer. From the, uh, from the U.S. Embassy with the senior Iraqi military and police officials, and that process has been successful to date in resolving any issue that may have arisen. We, th we, we believe we have a process in place. We believe it will be a successful one because there is a track record of it having been successful. The gentleman's time has expired. We will now recognize the Vice Chairman, Mr. Labrador, from Idaho for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ambassador Kennedy, you, um, actually, Mr. Bowen, you said that we are spending $75 billion in Iraq uh, currently. Do you know how much we are going to spend in 2012, FY 2012? Uh, the, the State Department proposal is around $6 billion. $6 billion. Um, there has been a lot of testimony here that, that if we decrease the spending levels, uh, it is we are not going to be able to do the mission in Iraq. So 75, 6, we are looking at a $69 billion savings, yet we are asking for more money for, for the State Department. Ambassador Kennedy, what is the State Department's budget this year? This uh, the, 
the overall the State Department budget request for FY12 that the President has just submitted, sir, is, uh, is $14 uh, billion, $14.9 billion for State Department. For the entire State Department. For the, for the State, yeah, the entire State Department, excluding our expenses in Iraq and Afghanistan. Fourteen point. Fourteen point nine for uh, Iraq, four point three billion for Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and fourteen point nine for our core diplomatic mission. Okay, uh, Mr. Kendall, what's the Department of Defense budget for next year? What's the request? Um, I'm. I would hesitate to give you a number off the top of my head. I believe it's about 550 billion for the base budget, and the here it is. I have it. I think. Nope, wrong answer. <laughs> Let me give you that for the record. I'm sorry. I should have it in my head, but I don't. Okay, but it's uh, 524. 524 base budget. 524 billion. So we're talking about 524 billion for the Department of Defense. The Department of State is going to have $14.9 billion. I mean, we are talking about a significant amount of money that is out there, and we are going to be saving uh, a significant amount of money by, by drawing down. Um, I am just not really clear why we need additional money and why any cuts are going to be uh, hurting us. Are there no savings out there that we can do? Is, this, is, is the Department of Defense, for example, not good? Since we are saving that money in the Department of Defense, can't we just transfer some money? I mean, explain this to me, Mr. Kendall. The Department has been under an intense effort to find savings ever since last spring when Secretary Gates made a speech in Abilene that uh, you may mm -hmm. be aware of. Uh, we have worked very, very hard. The, the services were all tasked collectively to try to find $100 billion in money they could save in efficiencies and move into other more value-added activities. We are cutting general officer slots. We are cutting senior executive slots. It has been an extremely intense effort to get rid of every ounce of fat we possibly can in our budget. If, as the Secretary has said, if we are going to sustain our force structure and modernize it as we need to, we absolutely have to find savings. Uh, so there is an intense effort there. There is not an ounce of extra fat, as far as I can tell, left in, in the Defense Department's budget. And I applaud, actually, what the Secretary is doing, but it just seems to me that if we are going to be saving money in Iraq, and now for everyone here to testify that we can't save any money in our budgets. It does, just doesn't make any sense. Are there, are, there are some savings. For example, in your letter, um, Ambassador Kennedy, of April 7, uh, you clearly asked for the equipment to be transferred to the Department of, of State. I think how much would that save us if, instead of purchasing the equipment, you, it was just transferred? I, do, I don't have that figure in front of me, Mr. Vice Chairman. But our budget request for 12 was put together after that, that was taken into consideration. So my, the, I would have had to adjust, request additional funds for the armored vehicles or the other equipment DOD was transferring to us. In other words, my request is net of the transfers that DOD is making to us. My request would have been higher if I would ha was having to buy the equipment. Instead, I'm I am receiving it from DOD, so I did not request that as part of my Iraq budget. So is DOD transferring all the equipment that you need or just transferring some of the equipment? They are they're, they're transferring everything that they have available in surplus. Okay. Thank you. I have no further questions. The gentleman yields back. We will now recognize Mr. Farenthold of Texas for five minutes. Thank you. As I have been sitting here, I, I wanted to talk a little bit more about some of my concerns I brought up in my earlier question about whether really this is the appropriate time and whether or not we have evaluated, uh, reevaluated the uh, drawdown deadline of the Bush administration uh, in light of the uh, amount of extraordinary efforts that the State Department is going to have to put into security. And I guess I would like to start off uh, asking uh, Ambassador Kennedy, in light of everything you are asking and the situation as you see on the ground, would you feel comfortable taking your wife and kids to serve with you uh, in a facility in Iraq at, come next year? Mr. Uh, sir, we permit, we permit uh, sp working spouses to, to accompany uh, the uh, State Department employees to Iraq now, and we will continue to do that. The answer is I would not, I would not inject children into Iraq now or later or any time in, in the near future. But there are, that is only one of a number of countries where part of my job is to decide 
where, where family members are, per, are permitted to go. All right. And then I, my earlier question to uh, Mr. Bowen was, are you aware of any uh, negotiations on behalf of the uh, Obama administration with high-level uh, Iraqis about possibly extending or renegotiating uh, the number of troops that will be in Iraq after the end of the year? And I, I probably asked that question to the wrong uh, folks, and I would like to address that uh, to you, Ambassador Kennedy, and uh, our, our two folks from the DOD. And if you would each take a second and uh, let me know if you all know anything along those lines. Uh, Congressman, uh, as Secretary Gates has said, uh, the uh, you know, initiative for any discussion on a, any possible follow-on military presence would have to come from the Iraqis. We have an agreement whereby we have mutually agreed to uh, draw down our forces by the end of this year, and we will honor that agreement. Uh, in his testimony, Secretary Gates uh, identified some concerns he has about areas where the Iraqis will need additional uh, uh, capability. Uh, but I want to say that you know, drawing down doesn't mean we are disengaging. The Office of Security Cooperation in Iraq uh, and the State Department's uh, FMF, FMS programs are going to be important tools for helping to continue to increase the, the capacity and the effectiveness of the Iraqi security forces, and the police development program, of course, will be very important uh, in, uh, as a complement in improving the professionalism of uh, the Iraqi police. So we are preparing for that outcome, uh, and uh, we, we do believe that the Iraqis, who have had the lead responsibility for security now for more than, more than a year, uh, are doing an increasingly effective job. Uh, the question was asked earlier, you know, is this going to be perfection? Uh, no, the Iraqis, uh, I think, understand that they have a long way to go in terms of building the institutions of a, of a stable state. But I think it is in our strategic interest to help them, and that is what we intend to do. And the State Department's programs and the Department of Defense's uh, continued engagement will be, I think, critically important I, and to doing that. I, I appreciate that. And I, but I am troubled by your uh, statement that the, any request would have to come publicly from uh, the Iraqis. There, there, there are two parties to this agreement. If I am unhappy with a contract, I am going to live up to it. But if I think there are some things that need to be renegotiated, I think it is open for either side to open it up and renegotiate. I just make that point. But, and, Finally, let me again. I'm going to ask the direct question: Is anybody uh, on the panel aware of any requests from the Iraqi government for us to up those numbers? Uh, Sir, I, I think we'll have to get back to you on that question. Okay, I, I would appreciate it if you did. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you. I'm going to recognize myself for five minutes as we wrap up the questioning here. Starting with Ambassador Kennedy, I want to be crystal clear. I want to go back to the very first thing we started with. Will the State Department give unfettered access, complete and total access, to the Special Inspector General to do their job? The, the, the All right. Now, the that says a lot right there. No, that's, that's my concern, is the, the hesitation. The Special Inspector General for Iraq has a mandate. We yes. will provide him with all the material that is relevant to his mandate. There are other Inspector Generals with other mandates that we provide information to. And so if the Inspector General for Iraq asks me for something within his mandate, he will receive it. If the Inspector General of the State Department asks I am not understanding what would be outside of that scope. Mr. Bowen, be as direct and succinct as you can. I have only got a few minutes here. That, that question is properly placed at this table between Ambassador Kennedy and me. You have raised an important issue regarding ensuring that Congress has all the information it has come to expect from SIGR about what is going on in Iraq and specifically about what is going on with regard to transition. We have an expanded mandate over and above what is usually the case for IGs. It's, it requires quarterly reporting that is cross-jurisdictional. As we pointed out in our last quarterly report, as is very specifically detailed in that October 7th memo you cited, the State Department has stopped giving us information that it was giving us before. That question is now before Ambassador Kennedy, and I am confident that they will resume giving us the information. We need to ensure that you have the information about what is going on in Iraq. Ambassador Kennedy, did you fair, care to further comment? Um, Mr. Chairman, I can only repeat my position. We provide 
the, I, the material. No need to repeat your position. I find it a troubling position, quite right. frankly. Uh, it is something we will continue to have to further explore, because as we will with the Department of Defense. Um, there are other questions that members would like to submit. We would appreciate your, prime, uh, your, your prompt response to those questions. As we wrap up here, I would appreciate maybe if we could start with Mr. Green and just go down the table. What is your number one concern? This is a mammoth, massive task that is before us. I cannot thank the men and women who are scrambling every day, putting their lives on the line to make this thing happen. I, I hope they understand the appreciation of the American people, those of us in Congress and others, for their good, hard work and, and dedication. But as we move forward, it is also imperative that we highlight the concerns that you all have. You are the closest to it. If we could just go down the line and cite what is your biggest concern moving forward? Uh, we have discussed many of them here today. I think uh, to name one or two, it is to ensure that we have the adequate oversight. It, the fact is that we are going to have a heck of a lot of contractors in country. Uh, but we have to increase the oversight because that is where we leave ourselves open to waste and fraud. Thank you. Um, Mr. Tebow. Excuse me. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, pro probably my number one in the context of these discussions is falls, it is explained in our charter, we, we get bound up sometimes in inherently governmental, and our charter tried to, the, by Congress said those functions that could, should be best performed by the government versus contractors. And in that context uh, and in our discussions here, we talked about these 14 items. Uh, I, I really think it warrants an analysis because the United States Army has built an exceptional capability over time. And to even think about transferring that capability uh, to me uh, introduces the potential for safety of, of government and contractor employees who reside in those locations that are protected. Thank you. Mr. Rowan. Accountability for outcomes. As Mr. Tierney pointed out, this committee and the Congress needs to know what the State Department plans to achieve. You know, what are the specific outcomes that $6 billion will be spent, if you include the program money, not just the operating money, that the State Department, if it gets it all, will receive this year? Knowing what the police development program will achieve with the 190 trainers across the country that are going out uh, to help the Iraqis improve, what outcomes will they achieve? Thank you. Ambassador Kennedy. Uh, achieving the adequate funding levels in order to carry out the mission that I have been tasked to do. Thank you. Ambassador. Uh, I share. Under Secretary Kennedy's concern, uh, as Secretary Gates said, ensuring that the State Department has the resources it needs to stand up this very ambitious and complex mission is critically important, and it is very urgent because there, are, uh, as the Secretary said, there are facilities to be built, there are people to be hired, so we need to uh, get them the resources uh, that they need uh, as quickly as possible. Thank you, Mr. Kendall. Uh, Mr. Chairman, let me first correct a statement I made earlier. Uh, the numbers I gave you were not quite accurate for the uh, amount of DOD presence in the future in Iraq. Uh, the total number is approximately correct, less than 4,000. But of, of that 4,000, about 1,000 total are security assistance. And within that total of 1,000, approximately 200 or less are actually DOD or government personnel. The answer to your question, in my, my, from my perspective, is time. Time is a big factor here, and we have a great deal to do in a relatively short period of time. Uh, in the fall, the U.S. forces will start to transition very much to exiting from Iraq. And we have to accomplish a great deal before then. Uh, along with that, of course, I would add the funding concerns that were expressed earlier. Thank you. I thank you all for your participation, your great work and service to the United States of America. Uh, thank you for the interaction and look forward to interacting with you in the future. Thank you. This committee is now adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.